Well, uh, first, I, I would like to thank Pablo Gregorini, mi hermano, and the organizing committee for this invitation. They truly honored me. I'm glad to see many friends in this audience. Thank you all for the opportunity to present this speech. I will talk about the recoupling of crops and animals to restore landscape multifunctionality. I have just 20 minutes, so let's move on. Let me put this issue in context. Professor Ian Gordon and his co-authors um, reported that modern agriculture is more and more disconnected from nature. Much of the increase in food production in the last decades has happened at the expense of nature, with consequences such as biodiversity di decline, nutrient loss, soil loss, and pollution. The disruption of uh, biogeochemical cycles, exemplified by nitrogen and phosphorus pollution and loss of diversity, are uh, the most visible side effects of modern agriculture. The global trend in agriculture is moving from diversity to uniformity. Diverse multifunctional landscapes had been replaced by very uniform ones. I believe that the trend in uncoupling livestock and crops worldwide is linked with this general specialization trend. Let me give you one example. In southern Brazil and Uruguay, rice paddy fields at the beginning of the last century developed always coupled with grazing livestock on Pampa natural pastures. Modern agriculture had decoupled livestock and rice paddy fields. Rice paddy fields became very, very specialized. These pictures illustrate rice paddy fields in Brazil and in Japan. I took these pictures in the same period, meaning winter, in between rice growing season. And you can see that these areas remain totally uncovered because crop farmers produce only one commodity per year. I was wondering how similar, how uniform were that landscapes, despite countries which are so different. How do we get there? A huge loss of diversity is the consequence of these very uniform landscapes. Therefore, intensive systems based on high inputs and specialization have produced landscapes which are functionally poor. So what we propose, we propose the recoupling of uh, crops and livestock to recover landscape diversity and multifunctionality. We propose alternatives to redesign multifunctional landscapes based on integrated crop livestock systems. This uh, redesign is proposed not only because integrated crop livestock systems are more diverse than specialized ones, but also because its characteristics such as nutrient cycling, plant functional diversification, soil health, can reconciliate agroecosystem intensification and restore landscape functioning. So this is the outline I propose from now on. First, I will present the benefits of recoupling grazing in agricultural landscapes. I will benefit from data from long-term experiments, meaning 10 to 20 years, managed by the SIPA Alliance, which is a non-profit organization that unite different research groups in Brazil. Then I will present our experience in redesigning landscapes at farm level, and we'll close with conclusions. 
I selected trials that will illustrate specifically the effect of grazing animals. They are very rare, not only because they are long-term experiments, but because the non-grazed systems have forage as cover crop. Hence, is not a pasture, meaning plant community, effect. The main comparison is pure cash crop systems versus cash crops in rotation with grazed cover crops, okay? So we consider this reintroduction of grazing animals in crop landscapes as a measure to recover many functionalities of those landscapes. To explain, uh, let me remember that pure crop systems in southern Brazil use no-till and in the case of soybean and corn crop, the farmers usually use oats and ryegrass as cover crops. Those are not grazed because crop farmers fear animal compaction and because it is stated that the higher the accumulated biomass, the better for the no-till technique. So in, in this case, uh, in Southern Brazil, so in wheat and other temperate crops is an option only for 20% of farms. For that reason, they just use cover crops. So let's start to, uh, uh, to present some uh, um, of our results. As I mentioned earlier, soil compaction is a paradigm in no two areas. I will introduce raises the grazing animals effect by focusing on the soil component. In two long-term trials, we concluded that grazing intensity and not the grazing method was key to grazing management. And using some grazing intensities, not only we can avoid soil compaction, but um, we can also improve soil physical parameters, such as soil aggregation. So yes, grazing promotes soil aggregation, which is an important parameter of soil health. So this is an example of effect on a soil physical parameter. Let's look uh, at this soil chemical component this time. In this paper, we use data from three of our long-term experiments comparing non-grazed cover crops to grazed ones to conclude that integrated systems had greater soil phosphor content as total and bioavailable orthophosphate. So grazing increases phosphorus bioavailability by 32% and reduces recalcitrant organic phosphorus. So integrated crop livestock systems can improve phosphorus use in farming systems. Now I will bring evidence on soil biological restoration. In these two papers, we reported that grazing animals increase soil microbial biomass and enhance the microbial diversity. The red column indicates the non-grazed treatment. In a third paper in preparation by our research group in the Cerrados tropical region, we present data reporting the increase in diversity of mycorrhizae as an effect of introducing grazing animals in rotation with cotton. It's worth mentioning that while modern agriculture trends to uniformization, the reintroduction of grazing animals restore complexity and heterogeneity in these landscapes. There is no crop rotation without grazing that can produce the phenomenon presented in these pictures. Dung beetles recycling nutrients. Sound grazing improves root production, creating larger poor continuity and fauna associated with grazing brings nutrient cycling pathways that don't exist in pure crop landscapes. Because of this, non-grazed landscapes have higher aluminum saturation compared to grazed ones. In addition, 
calcium and magnesium budgets were negative under non-grazing and positive under moderate grazing. Now let's move to a higher system level and other benefits from grazing. In another recent paper, we worked in collaboration with colleagues from the UC Davis, bringing evidence of long-term stability as an important characteristic of systems in which livestock was recoupled to soybean pure, pure systems. Stability has multiple meanings, but in this paper, we considered the concept related to variability. Using a 16-year data set, we suggest that yield, resistance, and stability are improved by the presence of the grazing animal. In red is the pure crop systems. The other are integrated systems in different grazing intensities. These numbers meaning the uh, sward high. As you can see, the stability of both human digestible protein production and profitability increased at moderate to light grazing intensities, while the absence of grazing decreased system stability. In this data set, we can notice that the difference in years experiencing draw are much higher favoring the systems with grazing animals if you see the minimum yield column right here. In other words, uh, livestock is the component responsible to stabilize the system. This stability is quite important in terms of food security and climate change scenarios. As we stress it in another recent paper, modeling simulated future climate conditions in collaboration with colleagues from CSIRO and UC Davis. As grazing is so important to these landscapes, just a few words to say that we have been developing grazing management targets based on animal ingestive behavior, assuming grazing time as a main constraint to animal production in pasture-based systems. I don't have time to explore this issue, but just mentioning that we use this concept on natural grasslands, pure sown pastures, and pastures integrated with crops. As I mentioned earlier, grazing intensity is pivotal to reach all those described benefits. In addition, grazing animals have been a concern in terms of climate change. So we have been working on targets that could conciliate trade-offs between animal performance and environmental impacts. In this example, grazing annual temperate cover crops between 23 and 30 centimeters is the best compromise between animal production and methane emission intensity. Well, those were scientific evidences of grazing animals restoring many functionalities of pure crop landscapes. So let's now move to practice and how we can recouple grazing animals at farm level. For that, I will introduce our PISA extension program. PISA is the Brazilian acronym for Integrated Crop Livestock Systems. PISA is a model of blended intensification frameworks aiming at agricultural development and sustainability. Integrated Crop Livestock Systems is the pillar of the program, of course, but we use other techniques to make the transition to new redesigned landscapes, such as no-till, spatial temporal organization of diversified crops and pastures, we use eventually trees, and so on. Small farmers are our main public. On average, they have small areas, 18 hectares, and milk around 14 cows that produce 13 liters a day, based, mainly based on silage and concentrate.